Welcome back to uh, week two of Sermon on the Mount, week two of Infinity. Because I was texting Pastor last night, and there is so much we could talk about in this. We could go on forever. We won't, I promise. But I, I, did, I did say before service, you could probably take four weeks on just each beatitude. There's so much to unpack, and you're like, that sounds impossible and sounds terribly boring. It wouldn't be, I promise you. Well, I don't think I can guarantee that promise, but I promise you I would try and make it not boring. We're not going to do that. We're going to try and move faster. But this week, I'm still wanting to unpack, introduce the concept of Beatitudes. I think a lot of times, um, a lot of these Beatitudes, Pastor Phil, I've heard like 85 sermons on Beatitudes. Great. Here's 86. And uh, I think that sometimes we, we get used to those passages and we kind of like lose the impact of them. So we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew 5 through 7. Jesus, it's paralleled in Luke chapter 6 and other places as well. And basically, it's a compilation of Jesus' sermons over a period of time. He is with his disciples and the crowds on top of a mountain, uh, or at least on a flat space in a mountainous area, a hillside, countryside kind of thing. And he is delivering this long body of text. Matthew loves long bodies of text in his book. Uh, and whether Jesus said it all at once or over several days doesn't really matter. point is, it's a compilation of his sermons, kind of connected in one piece. And the way it's grouped in Matthew kind of presents this idea of like a second Mount Sinai situation, where Moses went up on the mountain, came down Ten Commandments, all these laws for the children of Israel, and the creation of their nation after leaving Egypt. And here's Jesus early in his ministry going up on the mountain and, and giving uh, this big body of teaching that really illustrates what his kingdom will be like. Uh, it's kind of a nice comparison Matthew kind of paints for us. It's not a one-for-one. One. It's not an exact comparison. Uh, a lot of times we do damage to the scripture. We try to figure out, oh, this is exactly this and this is exactly that. No, it's not that. It's like the, the phrase, you ever heard the phrase that history repeats itself? That isn't the actual phrase. Uh, I think it's Mark Twain, and he said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And the idea is that it's never the exact same, but it's very similar. That's what God, God does in a lot of places. It's not an exact one-for-one -one comparison, but there's always some comparison, always some similarities. So we're going to begin tonight by reading through, uh, starting, starting in Matthew 4, getting our background, and reading through the Beatitudes tonight. So Matthew, starting in Matthew 4, uh, verses, uh, verse 25. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Chapter 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, and he said... This is where he's talked last week, very anticlimactic. But I said that by going up the mountainside, Jesus is, is kind of creating a space. Folks can hear him. Disciples are there. There's crowds there. Who's the intended audience? More on that in a second. Think about that for a little bit. And the fact that Jesus sat down indicates he's taking a position of authority, that teachers in that time and that place would read the scriptures standing and then sit down to explain them. You'll notice Jesus has quoted no scripture here. He's just sitting down, indicating he's about to explain perhaps everything in one, one manner of looking at it. He's going to present uh, an unpacked and fully explained view of how everything's supposed to work in his kingdom. He starts off then in verse 3 with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's so much here. It's a beautiful, beautiful set of eight blessings here. Just, just a really sweet layout of, of people who are oftentimes, immediately you see people who are down and out, they're blessed. It's very intricately woven, though, a lot of symbolism here, and a lot of nuance of language. If you look back real quick at Matthew 3, uh, it says, Blessed are the, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And all the rest of the, bl the blessings from there are now are future tense, for they will be, they will be, they will inherit, they will this, they will that. And then it wraps up back in Matthew 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for because, of the, because of the righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It bookends. The, last, the first and last Beatitudes are present tense. The kingdom is theirs right now. 
Everything else will be. It's an eventual thing, a future thing. Uh, but right, we are promised the kingdom in this moment. Um, these are the kind of nuances I want to unpack over the next few weeks. And tonight, I really wanted to get into the first beatitude, looking at the poor in spirit. There's so much to that, though, and there's so much still I want to walk through in introducing all this that we, I think we have to stop and hold back. And I want to start tonight by actually walking through what the word blessed actually means. But the word blessed used here is mar- makarii, or makarios, depending upon how you want to uh, transliterate it. It's a real-world word. It's not a religious word. There was a religious word for God's blessing, eulogia, and they didn't use that. It's not being used here. It's used other places in the Bible. It's a word totally available to them. They chose not to use it. This word markario means fortunate, uh, happy, or blessed. Okay? I love how, have you noticed how when you read the Beatitudes, you want to say, you know, not blessed are, but blessed are. It's just kind of a cute thing we do in English sometimes. We're so adorable. But anyway, like it, it, it means happy, fortunate, or blessed. Some translators will take it, look at fortunate, and kind of connote the idea of lucky. You're lucky if this. You're lucky if that. And not in the random chance kind of way, but like, how lucky are you? You know, that kind of a, that kind of a nuance to it. One commentator put it as, uh, or translated as divinely happy. Like you're happy in a way only that God can make you happy. Uh, or wrote, rewrote the phrase, blessed are the, as it will go well for. It will go well for the, for the poor in spirit. It will go well for the meek. It will go well for the merciful, and so on and so forth. Or one, one commentator wrote it as this, you are to be congratulated if. Like, good for you if you are meek. Good for you if you mourn. Good for you if you're persecuted, and so on and so forth. And the idea here, it's very clear and uh, very straightforward, is that as we look at all of these things laid out, okay, these are people who don't have, these people who are not on top, people who are suffering, and they're blessed. And that is not the way you want to start your, your, your kingdom moment. If Jesus is going to, hey, Let's talk about my kingdom. All right. Blessed are you if your life is terrible. Okay? And yet that's exactly how he begins it. Blessed are you if you're poor in spirit, if you are mourning, if you are meek. These are not attributes honored in that time and place or in this time or place. You know, the the exact attributes we are called to to exhibit and to emulate. Before we get into even all of that, I want to break down two big misconceptions about the Beatitudes. And the first one is this, that even though the word blessed is used, these are not if-then promises. If you are meek, you'll be blessed. If you are poor in spirit, you'll be blessed. That's not that. And and, and if you've, well, I always heard, you heard wrong. Um, and, And here's what I mean by that. Okay, too many times we take the Bible as like, it's like the cheat code of the universe. If I just do the Bible says, I'm going to make it rich. I'm going to do this. I'm gonna be, I'll be happy. I'll be successful. And the Bible never presents that. And for the biggest piece of evidence I'll give to you, I offer to you Jesus. He did it exactly right and they killed him anyway. There's no like cheat code in the Bible. There's no like easy path. Nothing in the Bible is going to give you the secrets to a, a successful and easy life. It's just not there. That isn't the point. The Beatitudes are not if-then. If you're meek, you'll be blessed. If you're merciful, you'll be blessed. It's not saying that, okay? It's saying if you are poor in spirit, it's because God's blessed you with that reality. What's it mean to be poor in spirit? We're going to end up a lot next week. But it means, to be poor in spirit means to be aware of your spiritual poverty before God. It means that you know that what you have comes from God and nowhere else. And if you've realized that, then God has made that real to you, and you're blessed in that fact. If you have the capacity to show mercy, it's because God gave it to you, and you're blessed to have that. You're blessed to be able to do that. The commentary here is on real present things in our lives, real future things in our lives, real spiritual and real practical things all at once. But it's not a do this to get that scenario. If, it, if it we're looking at it that way, then this would be more or less like some sort of like pseudo witchcraftian thing. If you do these things, you can force God to give you these things. And that's not what God presents at all in Scripture. He doesn't work that way. He loves us. We don't need to extort him. We don't need to twist his arm with stuff. He, 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 we're not spelling out some sort of secret mysteries by which we can gain things from God. We are being told how to be like God. That God's kingdom is for the poor in spirit. 
God's kingdom is for the merciful. God's kingdom is for the persecuted and the broken down and the beat up. It's not about how to get blessings from God. It's acknowledging that if you are those things, you are blessed by God. How, how that makes sense, I'll explain more and more over the next few weeks. The second thing I want to, end it, I want to get very clear right off the bat is that this is not a checklist. There's a lot of commentaries I was reading emphasized over and over again, and I've always felt this way. When we try and take the Bible and create checklists, we, we break the text and we, and we cut God out of it. Okay? Who's ever, uh, I taught for a long time on the fruit of the Spirit a few years ago. Who's ever, you know, the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience. All, yeah, right. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have the poster somewhere in your memory from VBS. Okay? Throw that poster away. Paul was not writing out some sort of like spiritual laws. These are the, these are the exact nine fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Like, Paul's not thinking, what will be good on a t shirt? No, he's writing a basic summary of the character of Christ in Galatians 5. He's not creating, here are the exact nine things the Holy Spirit does, just these nine, not ten, because nine's a magic number, because nine is three, threes, and God is three. I've heard all that before, guys. That's not how it works. Paul's not writing out some sort of deep, secret mystery of the universe. He's giving you a summary of what Jesus is like, what well, was and is like. And same thing here. It's not a checklist. You cannot sit down and look at your life and try and like, okay, poor on spirit. I work on that today. Now, that being said, we should self-evaluate. Am, am, I, am, I doing, am I exuding these things? If not, it's not about my effort. It's about my reliance upon God. The more I lean upon God, the more I realize how poor I am in spirit. The more I, I rely upon God, the more I mourn my own sin and the sin around me. The more I mourn injustice and pain and suffering and death, because those things should not be in this world. The more I rely upon God for my strength, the more I am meek, because I don't have to fight for myself because God fights for me, and so on and so forth. It's not about you putting effort into being these things, but you relinquishing your pride and your effort and allowing God to be these things in you and through you. It's not a checklist. It's a reflection of how close am I to God? At what, what space am I giving him? Um, the past week, I've had, a, I've had a really rough time just, just in my mind, getting myself in the right place, trying to think the right thoughts and just, and just um, feel good in myself. As so I was studying for this, Time and again, I, I was reading commentaries, going back to the Beatitudes and seeing this and seeing how, like, in the past week, I have just felt terrible about myself in comparison to who I should be or who God wants me to be. And realizing that's in part what it means to be poor in spirit, to realize I have nothing to offer God except for myself, whatever that's worth. And God has everything to offer me. And that's the beginning of this list, finding your place before God, realizing how poor you actually are in spirit. It's not about something you can force yourself, force upon yourself or force through yourself. It's a realization God brings to you to present a, a reality to you. Here's where you actually are, and I love you in that place. I will lift you out of that place. But that's where you are on your own. I will bring you to better places. It's not a checklist you can achieve. It's something that, that God does in you and through you. Um, in my readings, I've got several commentaries. One guy is kind of this tradition. One guy is this tradition. I have this guy, uh, R.T. Kendall. He's much more Pentecostal in his, his view of things. And I appreciate that because he says, he has this quote here and it makes this point. The purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is to demonstrate the kind of teaching and the kind of living with regard to character and conduct that should govern the people of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. The law could not provide this kind of living. And the point here I'm trying to make isn't that you should, like, don't worry if you're not merciful. It's okay. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you can't achieve it on your own. The only the Holy Spirit can make this possible in us. Cr turning the Beatitudes into a list of rules, a checklist to follow. Have you been merciful today? Have you been poor in spirit today? Have you been meek today? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost perverse. Okay? Have you been persecuted? Make sure you get persecuted. You know, it, it, it's a, it creates bad incentives for our behavior. Instead, we need to humble ourselves and by the Holy Spirit to produce those things in us, to transform who we are so that those things become who we are rather than trying to force them by our own will and our own effort. Because at some point, you're going to have a bad day. And no matter how much willpower you have, you can't force yourself to be meek on a bad day. Um, I had a bad day today at work. We had to do we had to do some testing and whatnot, and and my job is to make sure that the the, the the computer works for the test. So all I do is the website working. Nope, call me. Any other questions? Don't you dare call me. And you know what? Wouldn't you believe it? 
I got all these calls for things I have no control over. Hey, what's the schedule for today? I don't know. Call somebody who does. Hey, I got a kid who's falling asleep during a test. What should I do? I don't know. Call somebody who knows. But I literally, and every meeting we have on this testing situation, every meeting, every year, it's been five years I've been doing this, every year I go, guys, we're all professionals. We have degrees. We know how to read. I've emailed you this. I'm telling you this now in person. Do not contact me for a question not involving the computer. If you do, I'm going to be sassy with you because you should know better because you're all grown people. Okay? And you, I tell you what, wouldn't you know? Wouldn't you know? Half of my emails today were like, who's in charge of bathroom breaks? Not this guy. I just forwarded them all to somebody else. <laughs> I, just, I was writing the forward button all day long. Forward, I ain't going to acknowledge you. You, 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 know, you. you don't know how to read an email, listen to a meeting, I'm done. And I was, by about 11 o'clock, I was getting heated. Because like, we should be better than this, guys. We should be a lot better than this. And by 12 o'clock, my department head's like, you know what, we're going to go to Mexican today for lunch. We're going to calm you down, okay? We're going to get you out of the building. We're going to evacuate you out of the building. We're going to get you somewhere safe so you can calm down and just, just, just cheap, you can chips and salsa your way to calm this. And you know what? It worked, okay? It worked. The power of salsa, guys. And it is, amen, brother, I hear that. So, like, the idea, though, here is that, like, we cannot force ourselves to behave. But the Holy Spirit can transform us to where we are more like Christ and we exude these things. Now, the constant question I have in reading through all this stuff is, is Jesus talking to the church, to the disciples, to the crowd, to them then, them us now, Everyone, who's he talking to? And that, that is the question we have to explore time and again in reading this. Who's he talking to? And, and I, time, this is where the commentators all argue. And I love it because it means they're all right, they're all wrong to a certain extent. He's talking to the disciples. Matthew 4.25 and 7.28 indicate there's crowds there hearing this, but Jesus calls the disciples. So it's first and foremost for the disciples. It's for us. So the mount is for us first and foremost, but it's for everybody else as well. It's for the crowd as well. Everyone's there. Everyone's listening. These eight things he lists right off the bat should describe us. As we give ourselves over to God, they will describe us. We will be these things. This is the kind of kingdom he's building. These are the kind of citizens we have to be. But he's also talking to the world. The whole crowd is there, and that crowd is not all full of disciples. There's Pharisees there. There's regular folks there who are there for a show, hope he heals somebody today, and that's it. They're not, they're not really interested in what he has to say. They just want to see something. And so everyone's there. Everyone's listening. So he talks to his disciples and says, here's how you should be. Here's what I'm going to make you into. And then to everybody else, these are the kind of people that have been saved. If you're, if you're like this, you're in my kingdom. If you're not like this, you're on the outside. Be aware of where you stand, tells everybody on the outside. He wants his disciples to live these things out so that the world can see the demonstration of God's power in us. He makes it very clear. This message is for everyone. For disciples, it's who you should be. For the world, it's what you should look for, my disciples. You know, he's kind of, he's kind of cheating a little bit, saying, hey, look, hey, disciples, you should be like this. I'll make you like this if you let me. Hey, rest of the world, here's how they should be. Call them out when they're not. Let them know they're not, well, they're not. And trust me, we we're realizing very quickly the world will call the church out when the church is, is not, is not live, living up to the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And that, that's part of why I begin to look more and more this past few, few months and years is seeing how much, how much more work we have to do to be like God called us to be. And if we're living this way, if we're living out this way of mercy, of brokenness, of mourning, of, of meekness, of persecution, if we're living this out, we're going to see a transformation in our world. Because as Craig Blomberg put it, the Sermon, um, the, the sermon on the Mount thus forms the manifesto, the directive, the document, the guiding ideas by which the new community Jesus is forming should live. But the church must try to per permeate society with these ideals, albeit in a persuasive rather than coercive fashion. Permeate means to, to fill out completely, right? When, you, um, when you're adding like liquid to, to batter, if you stir it in, it permeates everything, right? It's it all the way in there, right? When uh, you open the fridge door and you have broccoli in there, right? That smell permeates the kitchen, right? It's everywhere. And our job is to permeate this society with the, with the, with the aroma of God's presence. How? Through meekness, through broken spirits, through mourning, through peacemaking, 
Okay? All these things. That's how we show the world who we are and who they could be too if they came to Jesus. We can't coerce people into meekness. We can't coerce people into, into living our kind of life. We have to persuade them with our own lives as evidence. And so as we are, as we are living out this, this, this charge, we can actually change the world. And we begin that process by looking at ourselves. And I remind you, I'm not going backwards. This is not a checklist. It's not a thing you take off. But it's a self-evaluation tool to say, am I relying upon God enough to be meek, to, for, to ignore fighting for myself? Am I living for God enough? Am I relying upon God enough that I can be a peacemaker where I can bring harmony, I can bring togetherness to any divisive situation? Am I relying upon God enough to be persecuted and to, and to rejoice in that fact? And so I leave you with a moment of reflection with this last quote here. It is from uh, Ferguson Sinclair, or Sinclair Ferguson, rather, two, two first names, uh, two last names. He says this, What is your heart set on as vital for your life and your character? What eight things do you most want to see developed in your life? Perhaps it would be a good idea for you to make a list. Does it compare favorably with what Jesus says? Does the list include poverty of spirit, meekness, a hunger and thirst for righteousness, mercy, purity of heart, a peacemaking spirit, and a willingness to be persecuted for the sake of Jesus? Or do you think that the real blessing is to be found elsewhere? And I think most of us say, oh yeah, I want to be like that. Okay, then go about it. Take time to surrender yourself to God and say, God, where am I? And where could I be? And, and show me how to take those steps. Show me how to let go of what is natural for me that I might adopt what's supernatural for me, which comes from you. I like you guys to, to think about that, reflect on that not only now, but also this coming week. And take time at your tables to, to share prayer requests, to share uh, the burden of living and pray for one another. And I'll come back up right around 8 o'clock to pray for us and dismiss us. Thanks for, so much for being here. I'm going to say a quick word of prayer right now, actually. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the chance to, um, to hear, to reflect, and to be um, confronted and convicted, and then to be transformed by your Holy Spirit. We pray, God, as we, as we think about these eight things uh, in, a, in, a, in a grand fashion, in the Sermon on the Mount, in its totality, we are confronted with this radical call to a new way of living that contradicts I mean, almost everything in our society today. And I pray, God, that we would, we would hear this word, that no one might bristle against what we've been raised to think uh, in the world. I pray, God, we would rejoice in the freedom you offer us because you're not saying, hey, go and change your lives and be this way. You're saying, come to me that I might transform your lives and make you this way, that I might uh, r- remove the pride, remove the, 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 the struggle and give you the ease of meekness and, 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 and of peacemaking. And I pray, God, that you would work in our hearts that way. You would direct us towards, towards you, that we might surrender ourselves and allow you to transform us. Put this in your name, Jesus. Amen.